Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Steve Morrison, Senior Vice President here at CSIS, uh, Director of Global Health Programs here. Uh, and I'm, we're joined and very honored today to have with us Tolbert Nianswa, and I'll say a few words about him in just a moment and why we're here and how we're going to go about this conversation this morning. I also want to thank uh, colleagues who helped pull this all together, Sahil Angelo, uh, Katie Peck, uh, Travis Hopkins has been very helpful, uh, and uh, Jesse Swanson, and so special thanks to them for pulling this together. Uh, we were traveling, um, Catherine Streifel, my colleagues Catherine and I, we're traveling in January uh, to Liberia and Sierra Leone, and in the course of that, we met this remarkable person, Tolbert Nianswa, who uh, is an assistant in, uh, minister of health, deputy chief, uh, medical officer, and most importantly, head of the incident management system uh, in Liberia, which is the central and most important institution driving the response and control of Ebola in Liberia. Uh, Tom Frieden, when, when he has visited Liberia at various points, has declared that this is the most important person in Liberia. Now, maybe that is <laughs> arguable in, in deference to the president and others. But one thing that became very clear was that Tolbert was indefatigable. He's a leader. He brings, he, he trained as a lawyer and uh, at the University uh, of Liberia. He went on to pursue um, his interests in humanitarian law uh, at Johns Hopkins, at Emory, and elsewhere. And then in uh, 2012 and 13, came to the Bloomberg School uh, to complete a master's of public health there at that institution. And then, as he will describe, uh, as a ministerial official, he became uh, at the center of the response, directly empowered uh, by the head of state to really carry forward this. And it became terribly important as the crisis worsened in the, September, in the August, September timeframe, as the mobilization um, uh, uh, took off in the uh, mid-fall and up to now, and as we've entered this new phase. Um, so we are really honored to have Tolbert with us. I learned also in speaking with him that he's a, a malaria expert. He drafted, he was responsible for drafting the first national plan under the President's Malaria Initiative, the plan for Liberia. Uh, so uh, he can speak to many different issues in the course of this. What we've asked uh, Tolbert to do is to speak for 15 or 20 minutes and take us through the story of the outbreak and the response and the different phases Tell us a bit about the way the government organized itself, his own role. Tell us a bit about the U.S. entry and the entry of others. Tell us a bit about where we are now in this current phase of attempting to get to zero um, in Monrovia and elsewhere within Liberia. It's a complicated story. Uh, we had the chance to go over this when we were together uh, in, in January, and it was the most lucid and, and cogent an insightful summary of the story. And so when we learned that Tolbert would be here in this period, we uh, asked him if he would come and, and, and do a public uh, presentation along these lines. There's plenty of seats up front. I also want to welcome the 75 or so people who are here online and, and the audience from, um, from C-SPAN. So Tolbert, we're very grateful and honored to have you here today. If you could carry us through that, then we'll do a bit of back and forth, and then we will move rapidly to the audience to get uh, comments and questions from all of you. So welcome. <laughs> uh, we're thrilled to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Stephen uh, Morrison, for the time. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here at this very, very important institution, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm honored and privileged to uh, talk to you all. And uh, thanks for coming out uh, to hear the story about the Ebola response in Liberia. Uh, horrible story. 
about uh, uh, what we did as a country, uh, how we came together as a state, and uh, put up system together very quickly uh, to uh, respond to one of the major threat, major global public health threat to our existing as mankind. Uh, we, as a country, uh, was like recovering from a massive civil conflict, uh, 14 years of civil conflict, rebuilding our lives as a country, as a people, uh, under the extraordinary leadership, uh, incredible leadership of uh, Africa's female president, president, first African female president, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who uh, democratically elected by the people of Liberia, uh, turned around very quickly and brought the situation uh, after the war years, the uh, desperation, uh, high hope of our people. We were on the trajectory, very good trajectory of recovery. Uh, after the civil conflict, rebuilding the healthcare system, rebuilding the education system, uh, trying to rebuild some of the very bad roads, uh, reconstruct uh, our infrastructure, bridges and road. And then we got uh, the, some of the important steps that the government made through the effort of the president was to even increase the uh, uh, government overall budgetary support to the healthcare system. Uh, we've gone 19% uh, of the budget uh, contributed to the health system uh, as compared to the 2015 target uh, of 15%, the Abuja target for 15% contribution to the health sector, Liberia has gone. 19% uh, even before 2015. Uh, in Africa, there was the number one country uh, that met MDG4 before the target dates. That's the under five uh, mortality reduction, uh, MDG4 by two thirds by this year. But Liberia met that target in 2012. Uh, reduction under five mortality. And we were making progress with also maternal mortality reduction, health system strengthening, and uh, before uh, the GDP growth has reached almost 8.7 percent before the Ebola crisis in 2014. And so 2014 had become a very, very difficult year in Liberia and the entire region the entire West African sub-region. And uh, my description of that uh, is that Ebola was not just something only intended for Liberia and the region, but we were really and really dealing with a disease that has had uh, serious implications on the entire world. It shows how interconnected we are as a people uh, because the fact that uh, Ebola can cross the border, it needed no passport to enter the United States. Uh, Ebola needed no passport to enter European countries, and we saw that. And so those of us in West Africa that are in the front line of fighting this disease are sacrificing for the rest of the world. And this is the kind of feelings that we got as people, as a country, uh, we came together to uh, fight this disease. And so under the leadership of the president, uh, we, when the disease struck in Guinea in December 2013, uh, very close to the Liberian border, uh, in Gwegedu, and we were, the proximity of the border, the, the poorer nature of the border, uh, we knew very well that Liberia wasn't safe, especially in the north, our Lofa County, the mm -hmm. most populated, that became the epicenter of the disease, 
uh, we knew very well that we were in a terrible situation. And so by March, uh, precisely March 22nd, uh, Ebola struck uh, Lofa County. We had a case of the disease. And imagine the entire region, uh, the Mano River Union, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, uh, there was no uh, viral hemorrhagic lab in Liberia. So we needed to take the specimen across the border to have it tested and know whether or not we were dealing with Ebola virus disease. And before that, uh, Liberia was also uh, battling uh, with the endemic country of Lassa fever. And the signs and symptoms of Ebola are related to some of the common diseases that we were seeing in our health system, like uh, Lassa fever also, uh, fever, headaches, uh, vomiting, bleeding from out of the orifice of hemorrhoids from your nose, from your ears, from your eyes. Those were signs and symptoms of loss of fever. So we could not really distinguish from whether or not it was Ebola or loss of fever. So the first case was diagnosed. Uh, our Minister of Health, Dr. Walter Gwenengali, pronounced the word that uh, Ebola outbreak was in Liberia. We notified the World Health Organization that we had a strange disease in the region. This was the first time that Ebola has left since the history of Ebola since 1976. Ebola have been in the East African area. We had no knowledge in West Africa of such disease, and this was the first time. So the health system was not that equipped to the extent to deal with uh, issue of isolation, uh, testing of people with the disease and all that. So we had to deal with the situation. And to do that, we had organized as a government uh, in the Ministry of Health, created the National Coordination Unit. We were meeting uh, every day, uh, strategizing how to deal with the situation, yet people were getting infected. So we had the first wave of the outbreak between March April. The first wave of the outbreak had only uh, six confirmed cases with uh, six confirmed deaths. So there were 100% case fatality rate of the first wave. We went, uh, we dealt with the situation, curved the first wave, and gone at least uh, 60 days without a new case of the disease. But then Guinea, and then Sierra Leone got hit in May. Uh, Guinea and Sierra Leone were still reporting the uh, virus. So we could not declare the virus over as a country because Liberian, Guinean, Sierra Leonean, we, we have intermarriages, we have cross-border issue, farming, uh, you can walk across the border and uh, no visa, uh, poor about close to 100 border crossing points on official and official. So we could not declare that we were out of the hood as a country. Then we had a second wave of the outbreak in May. That's the major, major and terrible part. Uh, Lofa County again became the epicenter close to the Guinean border. Uh, we have a number of cases uh, out of the 15 counties. For the first time, uh, the capital city of Monrovia got hit with the disease. We had a case, a uh, 14-year-old girl that traveled from Calawu in Sierra Leone and settled down with her family in Monrovia. Uh, Monrovia has two-thirds of the country's population, 1.5 million people, and uh, people started uh, getting infected uh, from the disease. Uh, we had three counties got infection, has become the epicenter. Uh, by the time we got to July, June, uh, Monrovia, Monrovia got infected in June by June, July, August. The situation has gotten under control. Uh, we were reporting like 60 to 70 confirmed cases per day. In August, terrible, uh, panic, fear, uh, 
despair, frustration. The government had to put in place a system to deal with the situation. So my role from the very beginning of the outbreak, I was chairing one of the thematic group, the social mobilization component of the outbreak. So my job was to go to all of the radio stations in Liberia. After putting in place the mechanism, I would go to the radio station and announce that we have the number of cases in the country, we had the number of deaths, so I was giving the daily situation report that we call the CTREP report on a daily basis and explaining to the Liberian population what Ebola was, uh, the signs and symptoms of Ebola, how you can uh, prevent yourself from the disease, the disease have no cure, no vaccine. So it's just like public information. The campaign, I was talking to the international press, the BBC, CNN, also calling on the attention of the world. At the time, uh, the World Health Organization country offices, uh, our development partners, the USAID, these organizations were focused on development work. So the emergency nature of this, to give that uh, emergency support to look at this as a threat to humanity, had not come. We did not receive that international support by March, April, May, June, July. And so we were calling the world attention that this was a global public health problem that needed uh, the international community support. So by August, uh, the World Health Organization Director General did announce, uh, Margaret Chen, that Ebola in the region was, should be elevated to phase three of uh, uh, disease pandemic as uh, a global international public health problem. Then my very, very good friend, Tom Freeney, who I must congratulate here, uh, the head of the Center for Disease Control visited Liberia in August, uh, sent in some sh very strong epidemiologists like uh, uh, Kevin Decott and the rest of the CDC folk visited Liberia, and then we sat down and established the incident management system in August, which the president of Liberia asked me to lead. And so I chaired the incident management system, uh, put in place uh, what we call the incident management structure with uh, key, key thematic areas. Those structures did exist even before the incident management system. The coordination meeting was established, but then you had to make it strong with uh, combined with international partners and experts. So with that, we, the IMS uh, incident management system was the tool. Because if you look at the Center for Disease Control, if there's an incident, they have the incident management system to support that. So it's, it's like a replica of uh, the CDC's incident management system that I chair in Liberia with uh, about five five thematic areas. Number one, in August, September, the outbreak was very big. Uh, 100 confirmed cases per day. People dying in the streets. No treatment beds to put people. There was fear, desperation, and agitation in the community. And so we had to put in place a case management team that's responsible building Ebola treatment units. We, we put in place social mobilization with community engagement as another thematic area. We put in place laboratory system as another thematic area. Epidemiology and surveillance with uh, contact tracing as part of it, and then psychosocial support. So those thematic areas were set up, and what we did from, as the commander of in chief, the president, under the mandate of the president, it was like, look, this is a Liberian problem. We facing the situation, we have to find solution for this. And so the intervention had to be led by Liberians. And so I'm in charge as the commander in chief of this country. And the incident manager with the thematic area was led by Liberians. So I chaired the incident management system, 
all of the thematic areas were chaired by Liberian. But what we did was, with our international partners, we incorporated them. And so each thematic area is chaired by a Liberian, but co-chaired by an organization like uh, CDC will co-chair the EPI surveillance team, WHO will co-chair the case management team, uh, social mobilization will be co-chaired by UNICEF, psychosocial support, logistics will be co-chaired by the WAFU program. And so we organize this national, multinational response to deal with the outbreak. But before we have all of this sophistication, the Liberian people themselves took charge of the disease, and then the social mobilization component, the community engagement component, and the ownership, people changed their behaviors over time. By September, we started seeing the curve bending. This, this in August, this uh, exponential projection uh, that 1.4 million people were going to die if nothing was done. CDC came up with the report that 20,000 people, WHO said about 20,000 people would die on a weekly basis. So the Liberian people got the message and said, look, we have to change our behavior. So simple messages were thrown out there. Number one, the disease has no cure. The disease has no vaccine. The disease had a very high case fatality rate of close to 25 to 90 percent, and so, but it's, it is preventable. So what you need to do is, if somebody is sick, make sure that you don't touch sick people. Make sure that you don't bury the dead. You call the health team. Ensure that you wash hands 24 hours with soap and water, chlorine. And so everywhere you went in Monrovia, or everywhere you go right now, there are hand washing corners to shops, to homes, and marketplaces, supermarkets. Everywhere there's hand washing corners, people washing their hands, no touching of their bodies. So the behavior change alone play a very, very critical role in combination with the huge, huge international support. The international community came very late, but came very big. And we are very much grateful when I told you we met in the office that uh, under the leadership of, of President Obama and the, the people of the United States of America, uh, we saw when President Obama announced on the request of my president, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and President Obama announced that this was a serious problem, and the word needed to come. We started seeing the, the Chinese, the Europeans, the Americans, and the entire world uh, came to the aid. By August, September, we started to construct about 29 Ebola treatment units under the uh, help of the US government. We were working with the US military uh, the Department of Defense, 101st Airborne Division, uh, General Darrell William, Major General Darrell William, and us were working together. Then Darrell left, and then Voliski, Major General Voliski, we had a trip. Uh, we flew on the U.S. helicopter on the field so many times to go and construct ETUs, go and visit the uh, labs. The country that did not have uh, laboratory system, we have about nine Ebola labs that were installed. We have community care centers, about 15 of them we constructed. Uh, community care center is where uh, you move people from the community, put them there, and uh, get, get to that point where they have place uh, to be until you prevent secondary in infection. Uh, we train contact tracers because uh, for you to get ahead of the disease, as we did, every infective person, the contacts must be traced for 21 days. That's very, very much important. So it's easier to break the back of the disease, uh, break the chain of transmission, if all of your contacts uh, are on the contact list. And if the person is infected and they are on the contact list, you can monitor them, remove them, put them in an ETU, 
uh, the Ebola treatment unit and uh, monitor them. So we started to see the trend of the disease come down between uh, October, uh, September, October, and November. And today, the exponential projections and increase of number of people that were going to die from Ebola, uh, we didn't have that number of persons. We had about uh, 3,000 confirmed deaths, over 3,000. Uh, we have uh, healthcare workers. The human story to this, this disease is associated with affection, caring for your loved ones. So the most affected people were close family members and healthcare workers. Because healthcare workers are those that give care to patients. So most of them got infected. We had 300 healthcare workers that got the infection, and 179 of them uh, died from the virus. And so this has really, really stuck our human resource development package as a country in the healthcare sector. And uh, I, I remember uh, as a person in uh, October, I had to lead a team myself to bury about 34 human beings die from Ebola. Uh, we were looking for a place to bury those people. Uh, there was resistance in the community because the community people rejected that Ebola people should not be buried in their community. So we had the government had to p purchase a piece of property that uh, from, from 12 o'clock in the afternoon uh, up to 2 a.m. in the morning, we were on the field trying to bury these people through a military deployed because there was agitation. The government had to deploy the military to help me protect the team and myself on the field. We saw stories where the mother died from the virus and the little kids would go to suck the mother's breast. We, we, those, those things this, did happen. We saw stories where relatives would look on their brothers and sisters and they are placed in body bags and cremated. Uh, burn because of uh, we had to make sure that people have safe and dignified barriers. So the combination of all of these got us to where we are today in Liberia. We have uh, 14 of our 15 counties that are freed of Ebola. For the past 21 days, some have gone 42 days, some have gone 60 days, some have gone 90 days. Uh, some counties have gone more than 95 days without a single Ebola case. And this morning, I read a report. It's also that way that 14 counties are still free from the Ebola virus disease. Uh, we have transmission still taking place in Montserrat on a weekly basis, sometimes three cases or two cases. But what is important is one single case of Ebola is an outbreak. So the fact that Monrovia is still reporting one or two cases, we are not off the hook yet. And the fact also that Guinea, Sierra Leone are still reporting huge number of cases. We hope the three countries can get to zero at the same time, and then we can celebrate and say, OK, Ebola is over. After Ebola is the rebuilding of the healthcare system. Why Ebola from the first place? It's because of a weak healthcare system. It's because of uh, inadequate resources to support the healthcare system. And so we need to build a healthcare system, not only pre-Ebola, but more than what existed before Ebola. Then we can build a resilient healthcare system that we can stop not only Ebola, but other epidemics in the future. And so this is the role that we play. Uh, now we are into phase two of the Ebola outbreak. And phase two has uh, four strategies. Number one strategy for phase two is to continue the community engagement, social mobilization campaign. Uh, number two strategy for phase two is the rapid isolation uh, treatment of Ebola. That is the right strategy. What we do. If there's a hot spot, we remove the cases and put them in an ETU and give them care 
and put that hotspot under control. Uh, number four is real-time contact tracing and epi surveillance. That is making sure that every single case, the case, the contacts are 100% on the contact list, making sure that getting all of those contacts to treatment early and cut the secondary infection. And number four in phase two to get us to zero is the cross-border initiative with Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, where we can have synergies in our interventions and uh, have the disease under control. But uh, my, my thing to the international world and the great help we got from our international partners under the leadership of the United States government is the major tragedy that will happen in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone is for our international partners, by this time this thing is over, to jump on an airplane and move to their capitals in Geneva, in Washington, in New York, and leave those rivalry health system and don't help us to build it. That would be the worst mistake that we would make. Ebola, as I said earlier, is not the only West African problem. It could have the same catastrophic effect on other parts of the world. And so we should take that very, very seriously. As I listen to the news headlines, the CNN, the BBC, and all of the new headlines, what you hear about now is ASE. What you hear about these days is uh, the Syrian war, uh, terrorism, and uh, we're not hearing about Ebola as we were hearing about Ebola in August, September, October, and November. And that has also an effect because it drives where the international support uh, should go. So we should maintain our focus in the region and ensure that the great help that we got from the international world to get to get into zero in these countries should be maintained so that we help to help the national governments through budgetary support, make sure their healthcare systems, uh, make sure that the agriculture sector like our government, major priority, port energy and roads, uh, major priorities of Madam President Ellie Johnson Sally. Uh, that's the hardware component of it, but the software component of it is agriculture, education, health care, and uh, better living for the people of Liberia. Thank you. Thank you very much. This week, um, we had discussed earlier, this week the president, President Obama, uh, spoke publicly, I believe it was Wednesday afternoon, to announce that um, the U.S. response was entering a new phase, that our military would be uh, phasing down to a residual force, residual presence of about 100 troops. It had been at its peak at 2,800, I believe is the number. But reaffirming a couple of things very very strongly uh, by the president directly. And the messages were that this was succeeding and we were in this new phase that you were in. That we were in, there, in, in on the long haul, but shifting to a predominantly and overwhelmingly civilian agency, non-governmental partnerships with your government in moving ahead, and obviously taking a region-wide approach. Um, it's interesting to remind everyone here, the, the U.S. response was driven by uh, the tapping into the disaster assistance accounts, of which by the time we got to the end of the year, we had expended somewhere in the order of $900 million, or made that commitment. Actually, how much was expended by the end of the year is another question, but a massive commitment. On the military side, there was a, an initial a reprogramming of up to $750 million. Um, the accounting on those expenditures is still not completed, but you see the vastness of the, of, the, of, the, of the response, and it was predominantly focused upon Liberia. And then in de December, Congress came forward and made an emergency appropriations of $5.4 billion, of which 3.7 is outside our borders, and arguably 60 or 70% of those funds are going into West Africa, 
uh, in this phase. And there is a focus on building capacity, building health security capacity, uh, helping in the recovery strategies. So at least for the next two-year period, uh, there is, from the U.S. standpoint, there's ample resources. Um, spending those really smartly and wisely uh, in support of good costed plans is going to be one of the challenges, I think, that we, that we face in this period. But we are in, I think, a fortunate position here. There's always in these emergencies the danger of a sharp, of a cliff, of, a, of the emergency fades, the threat fades, and the interest fades, and there's not that commitment over the transition period and into the longer term. And so having you here and reminding us of this is very important. I think some of the pathways have been laid down in terms of the appropriations and the, and the way that uh, those are oriented. If you could say a few words in reflection specifically about the military engagement and what was the significance in your mind of having the commitment on September 16th by the president of up to 3,000 and then having the deployment that followed soon thereafter. If you could say a few words about that. Thank you. I think uh, my reaction to that is I think the military uh, met their goal. I think they met their goal. Uh, they were able to partner very well. The U.S. Uh, military were able to partner very well with our uh, armed forces of Liberia, uh, gave them uh, capacity building, that partnership to build uh, more than uh, 17 Ebola treatment units in all of our counties. And the military did also help with the, the laboratory testing that got us very fast, turning around time of testing the Ebola mm -hmm. virus disease in less than uh, four hours. The results are available. Uh, that capacity was built. And uh, logistic capacity also moving around with logistics during the peak of the uh, outbreak. And so I think the military met that goal. Mm -hmm. So uh, scaling then down up uh, for April, I think it's a very good uh, timing of time, but we have to. And what I do also know is that even if there were need uh, in case, which we don't pray for, to have more cases, there was an opportunity to uh, get that kind of support back. Mm -hmm. But I think they met the requirement, they met the goal, we work together very closely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to uh, get Ebola treatment unit built, uh, get uh, logistics out there, make sure that the laboratory system was strengthened, uh, build capacity of our, our Liberian medi military guys to do a job. Mm -hmm. so, so you feel and, confident that today you have, through the incident, with the oversight of the incident management system, you have access to sufficient ambulances and laboratories. You have the isolation and containment. You have the case, case investigation and contact tracing teams and the data coordination that that infrastructure is in place. It needs to be sustained and strengthened. And as you say, within Liberia itself, the biggest immediate challenge is in Monserrato County and Monrovia proper, right? Right. Uh, that's correct. The, the capacity is there our response has reached the optimum that we can respond effectively at any time. Uh, we can, every county has a well-built isolation unit with the, uh, the U.S. general and myself was in uh, the last ETU, second to the last ECU was in Zorza. Uh, we visited there. Uh, every county is having its own Ebola treatment unit. That's mm -hmm. the uh, uh, case management components out of it. So if there were any resurgence or increase in the number of cases in any given county, you have at least uh, 50 to 100 beds isolation unit available. The, we were able to better pre-position our labs at a regional level. Uh, there were nine uh, labs that were taken to Liberia, but I think four of them have been placed mm -hmm. into regions so that we can have mm -hmm. uh, our testing capacity. Uh, it does not affect the contact tracers because those contact tracers, uh, community health volunteers, some of them are active case finders moving to uh, house to house looking for the contacts. 
social mobilization also continue. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing is that how we leverage the resources that went in there with the Ebola response to build our normal healthcare system is what we need to do now. Mm -hmm. With right now, the planning processes are going on with uh, building a resilient healthcare system, with costing a detailed plan, with uh, infection prevention and control, uh, looking at our healthcare facilities, and how you leverage the resources and support mm -hmm. the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. uh, one, but in a short, medium to long term, raising the kind of resources. Yesterday, I was at a ball bank. Uh, trying to talk to our colleagues there to have uh, some resources that we can raise for our healthcare system. Uh, Liberia has a, a pool fund mm -hmm. that we also uh, looking up to finding additional resources in there to support our clinics and health centers. Uh, human resource for health is a critical challenge. We lost a lot of our health workers that I told you about. The confidence in the healthcare system have to be built so that people can have the confidence to utilize the healthcare services. And by doing that, you have to train more physicians, you have to train more physician assistants, you have to train nurses, midwives. Even the last mile, uh, we still have not got to the level yet where somebody can work less than one hour to get to a healthcare facility. With those kind of system, you need your community health workers to reach with a large mark to provide services for preventable diseases, improve your immunization system, improve uh, your human resource for health capacity, uh, strengthen infrastructure, supply chain, and all of these services need to be. But how do you leverage now these resources for Ebola mm -hmm. to get the healthcare system supported? Mm -hmm. And the United Nations has also been very, very much helpful in the system with World Health Organization, WHO, and uh, for the first time, the United Nations established uh, the United Nations Mission on Ebola Response for the first time for uh, the UN Security Council to approve establishing a separate mission for Ebola. We think that was very, very much useful. This multinational partnership was critical in the response. Can you say um, a word about two issues, and then I'd like to open to the floor. First is the regional context. There's a lot of diplomatic activity at a very high level trying to figure out how to coordinate and knit together across the county, prefecture, districts on these large border areas where there's huge vulnerability of importation or just not knowing what's going on. So as you move towards zero within Liberia, the bigger regional context becomes ever more important in understanding and beginning to get a better understanding and better control over that. And I know your president has been in the lead in trying to stir action in that area. Where is that leading in your view? Uh, that's a critical point. From day one, has been on the minds of uh, the president of Liberia uh, she's directed us as a team, the technical team leading the response, to give support to the rest of the two countries. So uh, I remember we took some, uh, some PPEs, that's the uh, personal protected equipment for Ebola, the space suit that people were uh, provided some for Sierra Leone. We took some of our uh, equipment and lab services provided into Sierra Leone. Our healthcare workers have been mobilizing to also support Sierra Leone so that we get to zero at the same time, likewise in Guinea. Uh, we have one of our counties in Nima. Nima has gone 62 days without Ebola. But then across the border, in, uh, across the border with, with Guinea, you have a town called Lola. Uh, there was very active, huge transmission. They were reporting the 50 cases per day. And so somebody left from Lola, uh, a 12-year-old child travel because she had parents in uh, Nima. So travel from Guinea and got uh, Nima infected. And uh, similarly, in the, uh, in the Kalahun area, people will leave 
And so right now, we are very much concerned about LOFA that have gone more than 90 days with our single case. So the cross-border dimension is very, 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 very much critical. We have to work together as a team. So to address that, we're working at uh, three, three prompt approach. Mm -hmm. The technical team working together as one prompt, the community engagement working together, and at the political level, the presidents, our head of states, uh, President Selif, uh, President Conte, and uh, President Bakoloma are working very closely together, having regular summits to the address mm -hmm. and give us the support as technical people to move across border, move interventions across the three uh, border areas. Because if you see uh, right now, Liberia alone, all of the counties along the border area with Guinea and Sierra Leone for Liberia, we've, we've cleared. There is no Ebola transmission taking place from the Liberia side of the border. But across in Guinea, in uh, Prefecture the Gwigidu, there's active transmission still going on. And uh, areas like uh, uh, our last county near the border that got clear with transmission of disease was Grand Cape Mount. Mm -hmm. Uh, Grand Cape Mount has gone over 25 days with our and then transmission of these. So Liberia has been clear with the border area. So our concentration is how can you go close to the Guinean border and uh, if there are cases in Guinea, you can bring them across uh, Liberia, give them treatment in our treatment units, uh, make our active case finders, our active case sessions, our contact tracers, community health volunteers, community engagement, uh, that kind of collaboration with Guinea, Liberia, and mm -hmm. Sierra Leone with the cross-border uh, support is part of the interventions. So we're yeah. working on that very closely. Right. Yeah. Could you just say a, a quick word about the trials, and the field trials that are beginning on the vaccines in particular, but there's also a lot of work on therapeutics, on, on rapid tests, but the vaccines piece, uh, is it's historic. It's moving ahead at a at a very uh, a very rapid pace. There's a lot of questions around this. Can you say a, a few words about that? Uh, in, in Liberia, it's it's good you put me in this seat <laughs> because back home I'm always also in a hot seat about a vaccine trial. Yeah, trying to give explanation to the public about. Uh, what is all about, what we need to do about that, why did we at this time uh, carry on vaccine trial. But uh, basically, we are going to make history as a country to find a permanent solution for Ebola in the world. And this is not the first time uh, Liberia making history in the global public health community. Uh, in Liberia, uh, we were able to carry on research for uh, onchocerciasis, uh, river blindness. Today, we got 19 countries using the alphametin, the treatment for uh, onchocerciasis in the region. And uh, we bear the high weight, uh, highest burden of Ebola. And so it is very much important for us as a country to find a lasting solution for the disease. And the lasting solution from my public health background is immunization is the gold standard for prevention. Uh, immunization has made us in the world to eradicate smallpox. Uh, my professor, D.A. Anderson, and myself were in close discussion. He led the global efforts to eradicate smallpox in the world, heading the WHO global effort at Hopkins, and uh, in the world we were, uh, he was one of my professors at the John Hopkins University. This is another one sitting right there, Professor Stig. And uh, we, we eradicated small part in the world because of vaccination. Uh, today, uh, polio is also on the verge of eradication. Uh, we have uh, three countries in the world that are still having active polio transmission. Uh, Nigeria is, is one of those, but Nigeria is doing very well now with polio, uh, Pakistan, uh, Somalia, 
uh, Indian, oh. Indian did well a few years ago to eradicate uh, polio, and this is because of uh, vaccination. In our expanded program on immunization, we have uh, nine, nine different antigens. And the reason I'm, I'm giving this history is for us to have the confidence for the randomized clinical trial for Ebola vaccine on the way right now in Liberia to go ahead and for us to uh, be hopeful that we can have a vaccine uh, this year, a promising vaccine for Ebola. So the, the two different vaccine trials and a placebo have already started in Liberia. We have a site at one of our hospitals that's ongoing. Uh, before I left Liberia on Sunday, we had about 80 persons enrolled already in the trial. It is expected that by the 1st of March, we have the first 600 cohort enrolled in this vaccine trial and monitor the situation before we can enroll about 27,000 people as the steady protocol calls for. And this is under the leadership of the Liberian government, uh, the Ministry of Health, the partnership with the, the U.S. government, National Institute of Health, and the Liberian government, Liberia Institute of Biomedical Research, carry on this partnership. We are hopeful that if this vaccine works, we can have a lasting solution for the rest of the world for Ebola. Thank you. Let's um, move to our audience. Um, and therapeutic and trials have also started with yes. the ZMAP drug. Yes. Yeah, so we hope concomitantly they can go along and uh, uh, we can have therapies and we can have vaccines if, if they can work after the, at the end of the year. Uh, if we can have a vaccine for Ebola, then I think we've made a significant process as a global public health community. Great, thank you. We're going to take a number of uh, comments and bundle them together, so please be patient. We'll do three or four, come back to Tolbert, and then we'll do another round. We have about 35 minutes. Uh, we also have a number of people here who have been working very actively um, uh, in Liberia, and I would like to hear, hear from them. If, could, we, could you bring the microphone down, please? Just introduce yourself and be very succinct uh, in, in, your, in, your, in your comment or question, please. Yes? OK, thank you, and good morning. Uh, and thank you for both the comments that have been made. Um, please please wanna, introduce yourself. I'm Jacob Hughes. Uh, I'm with HDI. HDI works in the Ministry of Health. In fact, we manage the pool fund that the Honorable Minister mentioned, and our program manager is serves as a deputy to Minister Nenswa on the incident management system. The presentation was very enlightening about the very difficult experiences that the Liberian people have endured. As you move post Ebola and you look to strengthen and rebuild the health systems, I wonder if you could share with us what you think are two or three of the key lessons that must be incorporated into the strengthening of the health systems to help prevent this in the future. Thank you. Dr. Lacey, can we get your, any thought? I know you need to leave. Okay, and sir, and then yeah. behind you. Yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Abdullah Dukle. I also work with the president. and. I just want to thank you uh, for your great work. And I think your success uh, was shown by the fact that the burial team people were wondering <laughs> what they're going to do because there was nobody to bury. So I think that, you know, that speaks very well for, uh, of your success. And you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to see you. Yes. Good morning. My name is Dan Lucy. I'm a physician <clears throat> at Georgetown University, and I had the uh, honor to be able to work in Monrovia at a uh, MSF uh, Ebola hospital uh, from October 3rd to November 14th, and prior to that in Sierra Leone in August. First of all, I'd like to uh, uh, thank the minister for making time to come to the United States from Liberia in the midst of the beginning of the vaccine trials and so much of the work that he's been involved with uh, since the beginning of the epidemic. I really appreciate also you mentioned the shocking number of healthcare workers in Liberia who've been infected with Ebola virus and those who have died. Uh, in fact, uh, WHO this week uh, put out their weekly update, and I think it's uh, around 830 healthcare workers in West Africa altogether who've been infected with the virus and almost 500 who have died. 
So I wonder if you could um, offer suggestions or ideas for how perhaps the region and the world could have helped more in terms of providing health care providers to take care of so many patients in Liberia and in the, in the region, particularly, as you mentioned, during the terribly dark days of July and August and September. Thank you. Um, down in front here, we have a person who, right here, yes. Honorable Yen Swa, that was such a dynamic recount of the Ebola outbreak in Liberia and the multinational approach by the people of Liberia to get us to zero. Um, and so I, I commend you and your team on the work that has been done there. I, I'm Faith Cooper. I, I'm actually an independent consultant, but as of a couple of months ago, I was with um, a DOD health center that implemented the U.S. AFRICOM Disaster Preparedness Program. So I was in Liberia in April of 2014 and back there in July of 2014, not necessarily related to Ebola, but we were working with, with the government, coincidentally, we were working with the government to help in the development of the um, a national pandemic preparedness plan, which was supported by U.S. AFRICOM Disaster Preparedness Program. So my question is, one, my observation at the time while I was on the ground was just the, the behavior of, of our people, the Liberian people, I'm a Liberian native. They didn't believe that Ebola was real, and that caused a spike in the disease. Um, so I, I'm interested in hearing about their approach now moving forward. I'm also glad you touched on the regional capacity building, because ultimately that is absolutely important for the region. But my specific question is, the economic community of West African states mandates that all of its 15 member nations, at some point, must have a disaster management organization independent that oversees disaster management for the country. We were moving towards that progress in Liberia. How will this experience in Liberia contribute to the establishment of that entity that would take re responsibility for disasters in the country? Let's take one other additional question in the back there, please. Uh, we'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, my name is Charles Sharp. I'm with the Black Emergency Managers Association. I think she summed it up in terms of uh, the disaster management, in terms of the emergency management network, Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, for the West African nations. That needs to be established. Uh, I think your IMS system, that was outstanding setting that up, the coordination with all the stakeholders involved. And that's gonna be a key to rebuilding your healthcare structure, especially from the community level. And I wanna commend you for all the work that you've done. And one other thing with Dr. Lacey that he mentioned with the response to that, and usually response worldwide is, how are volunteers getting reimbursed and paid? I think you're leading towards that. I met with him at Georgetown and we discussed that. I talked to you, I didn't talk to you yesterday at the World Bank, but you mentioned that those plans you have in place, you're at that stage to build the Liberian National Emergency Management System, or agency. That's all I want to Thank ask. you. Why don't we come back to Tolbert, and then we'll do a second round, I promise. Um, okay? Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. These, these are very, very critical and uh, important uh, questions, salient points that you all raise, and I'm happy to, to touch on them. And uh, uh, the issue of post-Ebola lessons learned, I believe very strongly uh, one of the lessons learned that we need to take into rebuilding healthcare system is the issue of uh, IPC. That's the infection prevention and control. We need to have uh, infection prevention and control champions in all of our healthcare facilities. We need to have the PPEs in place, that's gloves, and make sure that we train every healthcare workers to use the infection prevention control materials, that's a lesson learned. I know very well that the number of healthcare workers that died in Liberia uh, did not die because they were providing services in the ETUs. They died from our normal healthcare facilities, clinics, that they were giving services and these are rare top specialist physicians, some of them that died in our major hospitals. And so infection prevention control is very, very key 
in our healthcare facilities. And then a lesson learned that we need to improve and take over is the issue of disease surveillance system. We need to build a real-time surveillance system that will track every single outbreak, every single infectious disease, every single disease of epidemic potential in our healthcare system. Uh, human resource for health, there were a lot of healthcare workers that were trained in the Ebola response. Uh, we used community health volunteers that provided services, our contact tracers, active case finders. How can we uh, put these people to work for us in the uh, normal healthcare facilities? Another one, resource mobilization is key. That's one of the lessons learned going forward to the post Ebola era. Uh, we spent millions of dollars during the emergency, uh, during the emergency phase of the Ebola outbreak. These resources we need to have very, very concrete support for the healthcare system that can look at the six critical building blocks of our health system. And if we do that, supporting our national health plan, the national resilient uh, health system plan, uh, before Ebola we had a 10-year national health plan, before Ebola we had an essential package of health services, we have the roadmap for the acceleration of the reduction of maternal mortality. These are all great, great plans that we need to have resources to support. So those are the lessons that we need to move forward. Uh, for him or resource, uh, he spoke about that. I think to have training, training is key. We need to train more healthcare workers, capacitate them, we need a change of real-time uh, trainers, it could be physicians that have the skills to go in our medical institutions. We did lose some of our professors that were teaching at the medical school. So some of the foreign medical teams, uh, right now we're using some of them in our healthcare facilities. We need to get more to train our professional cadres of health workers, uh, provide them not only uh, post Ebola, but then train them over the year as a long-term plan for Liberia to have that kind of cadre of healthcare workers in place. Uh, behavior of people was critical. Uh, people died from the virus from the very beginning because of denial, but we learned the hard way. Our citizens learned the hard way. Uh, a lot of people lost their lives before we got to realize that this disease is associated with behavior, touching people, uh, playing with their bodies. And so by the time they got to know and that community ownership got into the process, we begin to turn the curve and bend the curve in the epidemic. So community uh, ownership, community engagement is, is, is very good. But the, the disaster preparedness network that she spoke about, we're all working on that before the Ebola crisis uh, with the U.S. Department of Defense through our Ministry of Defense, our Ministry of Internal Affairs. Uh, we were trying to get a regional disaster network, uh, pandemic preparedness plan that we were working on before the crisis. I think it's very much necessary and critical. Uh, the Ebola disease have a lot of survivors uh, that we need to concentrate on. We had. Uh, the thinking was Ebola disease was 90% uh, case fatality rate, but the Liberian situation, we had like 50% case fatality rate. So a lot of persons that got infected from the virus did survive. We have about 1,400 Ebola survivors today in Liberia, including uh, uh, we also have 3,000 plus offense that the uh, Ebola disease created. The kids need our support, they need our blessing, they need our psychosocial, uh, as, as, as people of a civilized world, to take care of them. These orphans need our care. They need Do they face stigma, the survivors oh, and the course, orphans? Of course. At a certain time, we had to create, uh, we had to create a camp for them mm -hmm. where we had to put some of them and gave them that psychosocial support because 
some of them lost their both parents, they lost their aunties, they lost their brothers, and so the government was providing support for some of them. So, and they face, they face very, very huge stigma. One of the, the president's goal, uh, President Selly's goal, is to ensure that they can go to the same school like any other child. But being an Ebola orphan doesn't mean you should be stigmatized and sent to another school. So we're raising uh, resources and uh, trying to get international support, partnership also to support some of these orphans that uh, about 3,000 of them under our Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection. Thank you. Uh, there's a hand down. If we could get a microphone down here. Hi, um, Dr. Donna Wells, Clandestine Service, Central Intelligence Agency. Um, can you talk about the income of Liberia's middle class? What do they live on? Thanks. Lynn and then behind. Hi, I'm Len Ribbenstein from Johns Hopkins, and we're very proud of you at Hopkins. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, you mentioned, uh, and many people have mentioned, the weak health system, and of course there's a civil war, and you mentioned also the capacity building initiative after the war, the basic package. I'm sure you reflected, uh, and it would be really interesting to hear your insights on digging down on what were the spe most specific impacts of the war and the healthcare building initiative that gave the possibilities to respond as you have? What were the strengths that were built out of the experience? And conversely, what were the weaknesses that were revealed from the Civil War and then the healthcare uh, building initiative? Thank you. And it, are, are you done? Yes. Could you just hand the, the right behind you and right Sorry. next to you? Yes. You. We'll take the two of you. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. I am O'Donnell with the International Crisis Group. I have two questions. The first one is regarding your role during the acute crisis phase. Do you have any comments on the urban control measures, such as the role of security forces, quarantine um, controversies? And also, how did the IMS and the Ministry of Health adjust in October and November after having been excluded from the initial planning talks uh, of UNMIR uh, in Accra? Thank you. Thank you. Can you repeat that one? The, the, the second the question? The Accra one. Yeah, I didn't get that. Yes. Um, you know, how, how the IMS and uh, okay. the Ministry of Health adjust in October and November after being excluded from the initial planning talks of UNMIR? This was in the first week of October. Yes, exactly. When UNMIR had the, the initial planning talks in Accra and the governments oh, were excluded. we didn't include <laughs> We had Tony Banbury here last week okay. in October too walked us through and that was, exactly. a, that was a, a very interesting sort of moment in the evolution. Yes, right here. We'll come back for another round. Yes. Hi, I'm Katie Broadwater. I'm with the Defense Department. I'm working on a suite of biosurveillance uh, programs. I was wondering as the outbreak started, what did you find was the best method for disseminating information on the outbreak, not only to healthcare workers and professionals, but to the general public? And how do you plan to continue providing information as we approach zero human cases? Thank you. Why don't we come back to you, Tolbert? And uh... okay, I will start from the last one. We use really multiple channels of communication. We did not use uh, one channel. At one point, uh, we were using uh, radio communication, going on the radio. Ebola is this. Ebola is that. This is how you prevent it. But at some point, we needed interpersonal communication. So IPC was also great. There are two IPCs. You have IPC for infection prevention control and interpersonal communication. So with the multiple communication channel, IPC played a critical role. You cannot go on a radio, somebody lost their loved one from Ebola, and say you are a contact, you have to remain uh, quarantined for 21 days so that you get to follow up. You need to go to them, first of all, show your solidarity, gave that psychosocial support to them. And so IPC was very, very much critical in the communication campaign. And when communities, uh, after they got the information, the community did form their own tax forces. So there were tax forces all around the place, from one community to another community, and people were going from house to house telling others about what the disease is and all that. So multiple communication channel 
printings of uh, flyers, uh, getting information to healthcare workers, uh, printing of posters, community engagement, town hall meetings, uh, focus group discussions, all of those took place. But what is critical is the community ownership is very, very much critical. Once the community knew that this is a very contagious disease, they can turn the tab by themselves. There were times that there were time that the community had to put their own roadblocks. If you got in a taxi cab or in a commercial bus and got into a county, the community people will come out and quarantine you, self community self-quarantine, because they got the information and you got sick, they will call the ambulance very quickly to get you to the health facility. So that community ownership was also critical in the information campaign. Uh, security quarantine did not work well. Uh, it wasn't one of the strategies that those, as we were dealing with the crisis in Liberia, we had lesson learned what worked and what didn't work. Security quarantine wasn't one of them that worked very well, so we had to change that strategy. Community quarantine did work to say, okay, we the community will take the, we initiate the, uh, we don't have to be policed by uh, uh, military. We don't have to be policed by security personnel. We can understand. And then uh, when they themselves got engaged, when they themselves owned the situation, then we, start, we started to see a great, great level of improvement. The OMIR situation, OMIR was planning as a UN agency, as OMIR. But what we did was, when the planning meeting was over, uh, whatsoever was developed in Accra, in Liberia, we worked with the OMIR crisis manager, Mr. Peter Graf, and his boss, Mr. Tony Banbury, who I know very, very well because we worked together. We were able to own our plan as a country. So we did work together, strategize together, change some of the indicators that were playing in Accra, and made it a Liberian-owned plan, and that was endorsed at our President Advisory Council meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, the President of Liberia chair a council called the PACE, the Presidential uh, Ebola Council, chaired by Madam President. And that plan was presented to the President and we were able to adapt that plan with our own Liberian based on the context in, in Liberia. Uh, with the strengths and weaknesses in the health system, the Ebola did expose the weakness of our health system. We, we thought we were doing the right things. We thought we have a strong system, though it was not that strong, but coming from war with all of the efforts that we made, uh, getting MDG4 under control, our supply chain system tried to improve, uh, we were training a lot of medical doctors, we were training nurses, we were trying to also look at all of the building blocks of our health system. But when Ebola struck, we knew that it has exposed our healthcare system. So there's a lot of work to do uh, with the healthcare system. But what was also the strength was that there were a lot of trained people that knew what to do. So when the Ebola crisis started, we did not wait for the international community to come before we start. We already started dealing with the situation. Even before the international help came in September, the curve started to bend because we did work with our people and that also helped in uh, dealing with the situation. Thank you. Um, let's, we've got a lot of hands up. Let's start in the back over on this side here in the back row. There's two, two, two gentlemen there. Hi, uh, Brett Sedgwick from Global Communities. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, and you've been a great partner of ours during the implementation of the, the response. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, about the, the mix of um, implementation approaches of the response, uh, the one being uh, implementers that are coordinated by uh, the IMS and by the, the government, and then the other uh, with uh, support being given directly to the government um, to, uh, to, to implement itself. Um, it's something that we thought was really interesting uh, 
how that was that was very mixed um, in its approaches, and I wanted to get your thoughts on on effectiveness um, on on both sides of the clinical and non-clinical side of the response. Thank you. Could you Thanks. just ha just in front of you? Yes. Okay. There. Hello, Mr. Minister. Uh, my name's Jerry Martin. I'm the uh, director of uh, a new AID program called Preparedness and Response. And we're focused on looking at uh, emerging pandemic threats originating in zoonotic diseases. And of course, Ebola is a zoonotic disease. I'd be interested in your opinions and thoughts about in the post-Ebola world in, in Liberia. Um, what, what approach uh, do you see it being uh, taken to re, uh, for preparedness and response for diseases that uh, may be of unknown origin? And uh, what lessons have you learned from the Ebola outbreak? And just hand it to the woman next to you there, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Erin Taylor from Georgetown. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how women and children were uniquely impacted and perhaps what planning um, you're thinking about um, relating to women and children going forward. Thank you. And hand it right to Paul in front of you there, please. Hi, my name is Would Paul like Emer. I'm approach? a uh, retired Foreign Service Health Officer with USAID. Just had a couple of quick questions that you might have some insight on. Uh, one is uh, the, the, uh, the response uh, in Liberia seems to have been different than the response in Guinea, particularly on community social mobilization and uh, communication and so forth. And I'm just wondering if you can, you must have had some experience with Guinea as well and the other countries, without criticizing, if you can tell us how it was that you were able to be more effective in your community mobilization efforts than maybe some of the other countries that we've heard about were. And the second question is in terms of the U.S. response, which I think we're all proud of. Uh, we have seen some reporting here in the U.S., some criticism saying, and not criticism, but saying that it was late. And I'm just wondering uh, if you can uh, comment a little bit on, on that uh, from your perspective on the ground. Uh, was it late or wasn't it late? And how did it work? And how many Thanks, centers Paul. got built? Can you, that woman, just to your, to your, Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm with the Corporate Council on Africa, and I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to the private sector response, both in terms of NGO nonprofits and more especially the business sector. Um, how did they respond? What type of partnerships um, have you seen? And what would you like to see from the private sector moving forward to build a stronger health system? Thank you. Let's come up here, please. And then we're going to come back to you, Tolbert. Yeah. Hello. Thank we're you so much. Them up on you. Thank you so much for your time and perspective this morning. Um, I was wondering Please if you could. Please identify yourself. Oh, I'm Christine. I work at the National Institute of Health, um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more upon the psychological remnants of the scare of Ebola in your community and the stigmatization of orphans that you mentioned, and if you could speak more upon the experience of battling the fear and anxiety that ignited in your community in the outbreak of Ebola in different ways that you learned to incite hope in the challenge of this aggressive disease. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you again. Uh, the, the coordination of the response, clinical and non-clinical, uh, I think it's a very, very interesting one. What guided us was one strategy, one program, one response. That was the slogan, that was the goal. So all of our international partners that came in to help in the response in Liberia, the message was one response, one strategy, one program, under the leadership of the government, under the leadership of the president. So the president of Liberia got very, very much involved we saw that uniqueness, coordination, togetherness of the people of Liberia, government and the people, when we got to know that this was a common enemy. And so under the leadership of President Sely, she did empower us as Liberians who have the technical know-how as public health experts to work with our international colleagues with also public health knowledge to deal with this situation. At the very beginning, it was a bit difficult. It was a bit chaotic because you had this was or this is a health response. This is a public health crisis. So it has to be dealt with 
by the Ministry of Health of Liberia. So the government did realize that, and the president did put the Ministry of Health in charge. So we developed the thematic areas that I mentioned to you, case management, laboratory thematic area, psychosocial support thematic area, social mobilization, epi surveillance. All of these thematic areas, our international partners have staked in those areas. So one IMS with these thematic areas, we did work together as a team. So uh, when I chair the IMS meeting, if there are issue with lab, I put CDC on the spot. I said, CDC, you are the expert for lab here. Uh, you brought the labs, you're here to work with our librarian team. I need a presentation in the IMS meeting of what happened, why those cases were not tested in 24 hours. And CDC knew that they were in charge of lab with our team. He as much that they had the support, they had the resources, they took responsibility as, as, as an institution. If there were issue with uh, uh, awareness, social mobilization, I look in the face of the country representative of UNICEF and say, look, the world mobilized resources for UNICEF to support the response with social mobilization. That's not a clinical part. If there were issues with clinical part like treating people in the Ebola treatment unit, I heard WHO and MSF accountable in the IMS meeting and say, look, as a government, people are not being treated. People are rejected in the street. We need to get these Ebola treatment units in place immediately to treat people. And so with also epi surveillance, WHO and CDC were also in charge. So my CDC colleagues, epidemiologists, uh, we asked them, we have to do this. So that's, that's how uh, the cohesiveness of the response, the one response, one strategy, that's how when it came to logistics, we asked the BFP, uh, chaired by a Liberian, co-chaired by the BFP. So the lock cluster was giving support. If we needed to move PPEs to the counties, we got the plane, we got the boat, we got the vehicles to move those things. So it's, it's, it was a unique response in Liberia with the great support from our international partner because we held it accountable. And we still hold it accountable. If there are areas, we didn't have the resources as a country. We know the world did mobilize resources from the US government. So those agencies on the field that were implementing safe and dignified barriers. Uh, you have the IFRC, the International Federation of the Red Cross, and there's a US uh, NGO called Global Community, sponsored by USAID, play a very, very critical role in their body management. In less than a month, we were able to establish 74 barrier teams with logistics in all of our counties. So I can, in my IMS meeting, if a body stayed more than 24 hours and was not picked up from the community and buried, global community have to answer questions, why is it working? Or IFRC have to tell me the next day, why is this county not picking up their dead bodies on time? So that was a response that we managed and worked with our partners. And I think it worked very well. We can get to zero soon with that coordination of the response. Uh, post Ebola, uh, preparedness and response, uh, what lesson learned? While we still battling Ebola, we're working with our international partners again, like uh, CDC, the Center for Disease Control, has an agency called the uh, CDC Foundation, and also working with eHealth. As we speak, we're now building a permanent emergency operations center for Liberia. And in each of our counties, we are working with them to build EOCs in those counties that we serve for preparedness and response. So we're leveraging the Ebola crisis to rebuild our healthcare system with that also. Women and children were highly affected. Very highly affected women and children. Our market women were very much moving from one country to another. We had Liberian market women flying from Liberia up to Dubai, flying from Liberia into China, 
into the United States, into re the region, in Guinea, in Ghana. Uh, Liberian women will get on the airplane, go and buy their produce, get it to the market in Liberia. Guess what happened? All of the airplanes stopped flying to Liberia during the Ebola crisis, except SM Brussels that I came with. I don't know how you have me at this forum if SM Brussels didn't fly me here because everybody was afraid of Ebola. So that affected the women. Our countries closed borders. Ghanaian closed their border. Guinea closed their border. Senegalese closed their border. At some point, market women cannot travel to go to one country to get their produce to the markets in Liberia. That affected their economic and social impact. Children got infected. Their mother's parents died. They are today often 3,000 of them. That's a critical problem that the government faces. We're working together as a region, the Mano River Union, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. There are things that are working very well in Guinea that we're learning lessons from. There are things working in Liberia very well that Guinea is also learning from. And the fact that Liberia is getting to zero early put a pressure on Guinea and Sierra Leone to also get to zero. It also put pressure on partners, organizations, and countries, bilateral partners that are supporting those countries. So they are lessons that we're learning from each other as countries to move forward. But I think the major thing is working together in the community, that community engagement component, not with military. It cannot solve the problem, not with force. So uh, our sister countries, some of them still having resistance and agitation. Uh, force cannot do it. You just have to get a community involved and make sure that uh, they do the right thing. The US respond. Somebody asked whether or not it came late. The entire world came late to the Ebola crisis. The entire world came very late to the Ebola crisis. The War Health Organization made a mistake. That's one of the lessons that we have to learn as the global health community. Disease have no boundary. If it is in Southeast Asia, if it is in Europe, if it is in America, especially countries that don't have the capacity. Developing countries, especially South Saharan African countries, health system weak. We knew the Ebola crisis since 1976. And we knew very well it was the first time it was entering capital cities with huge population. The world would have intervened in March and April and June or May. But we intervened late. So the whole world is a lesson learned. Uh, uh, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, visited Liberia. We sat together. We had discussions. Uh, the World Bank president did visit Liberia. Uh, USAID administrator. And my message to all of them, including you, when I told you in Monrovia, that the war came late. But when they came, they came very big. They came very big. The United States government came very big to the rescue of Liberia. We did appreciate that. I'm, I'm very, very much optimistic that the president of Liberia did appreciate the U.S. government by deploring the military, by building our laboratory system for Ebola, for getting us to zero on time is because of the support that the U.S. government did send from all worth of life. USAID was there. Uh, CDC came in with epidemiologists. We had the U.S. military moving in with logistics, at which it was done in March or April. We would have lost 3,000. We would have lost 8,000 lives in the region. 20,000 people wouldn't have been infected from the Ebola virus disease today. They came late. They came huge and supported us, and we appreciate that. Tolbert, I think that's a, a very resounding compelling conclusion to our 90 minutes together this morning. Um, thank you so much for being so uh, compassionate and candid and detailed and taking on all of these multitudinous issues with such clarity and such sensitivity. And thank you for the leadership that you have demonstrated and sustained over many months 
your contribution is just enormous, and the story that you tell is a, is a very positive story at the end of the day. And so thank you so much for being with us. Congratulations on the results. Of thank, you. thank you. Thank you.